and welcome to my presentation. I'm super, super thrilled to be talking to you today about my favorite topic, and that is code reviews. My presentation is called From Bottleneck to Superpower, and it's a presentation about all the findings that I collected and, and the research results that I, that I got from the last 10 or even more years of researching and working with teams on their code review practices. So um, I was for quite some time at Microsoft and I was, um, I was responsible for analyzing the code review processes at Microsoft and helping teams adopt better, better practices. We also own the code review tool, the internal code review tool Codeflow at that time. And so this is how I came in contact with code reviews. And over the last years, I, I really got very fascinated by this topic and I did more and more studies in that area, but also I worked more and more with teams, not only at Microsoft, but around the world on the code review practices. And today I'm going to share with you how you can actually improve your productivity while doing code reviews and what problems we actually have during code reviews with productivity. So I'm super thrilled to dive in with you in this really fascinating topic for me. And um, if you want to find more about my work, go to awesomecodereviews.com. But now let's go into that. Um, if you look at code reviews, we see that code reviews offer a large variety of benefits. It starts from, well, you get more readable and more maintainable code, at least that's what we hope. You get improved solutions. You have an accident prevention mechanism with code review. Maybe you find bugs. Um, there is tracing and tracking, which means that you can go back and really understand why a certain solution has been implemented in a certain way. There's also learning and mentoring happening in code reviews and knowledge sharing. So, plenty of reasons why people want to do code reviews. The question is, is that actually true? Are we, are we setting out to do that, but do we actually get those benefits? And there are a couple of studies that actually show that we are getting those benefits out, right? There are studies on uh, how code reviews correlate with a reduction of defects in post-release and pre-release software, so before we release it and after. Um, we see that, for example, unreviewed code is two times more likely to introduce defects than reviewed code. There are also studies, this is a, a newer study by, done by Google or at Google, and the, it shows that 80% of the code reviews lead to code improvements. So yeah, right, that's good. And there are also findings around knowledge sharing, for example, by Rigby, which shows that um, code review really increases the uh, the knowledge of a team member about the code base, right? So more people are aware what's going on, more people have really knowledge about the code base. So all of these good things are really happening in code reviews. And so it's no surprise that when the pull request development model, which was introduced a couple of years ago, um, a lot of people actually hopped on the code review wagon, but I don't think it was extremely deliberate. So it was more than the source control versioning system suddenly had a feature that we are using, well, a pull request, right? And so while we are doing a pull request, instead of pushing the code over, somebody has to pull it in. And if these are two people, what are they naturally doing? They're looking at the code exactly because they don't want to pull something in that they have no idea what it is. Somehow it's their responsibility. And so in this, in this change that happened here in the way how we're developing software, we saw that now suddenly people are adopting uh, code reviews, right? And very often nowadays, code reviews are actually used synonymously with pull requests, even though it's not the same thing, right? A pull request is not a code review. You can have a code review without pull requests and a pull request without code reviews. But very often it's used um, at the same time. And this is why we also see it as, as something um, as similar, right? And so now all these companies having this code reviews and this pull request or pull based development model and they think well we will be so happy right our developers will just uh, learn they will strive they will the code base will improve and and everything is great everything is great but actually that's not what happened right while i love code reviews a lot of people don't love code reviews while they are very widely adopted they're also creating a lot of problems and here are just a few of them i've been working with so many teams and it doesn't matter how serious they are about code reviews or how how eager they are to make them work um, still they are uh, experiencing some of those pain points that i have listed here and this is really just a small um a small subset of all the pain points but they're dealing with large reviews. What happens? Well, now it's difficult to review it. 
I don't understand the context here. Uh, they maybe have to wait for their code reviews to be, to be done by, by the engineers. Maybe there is time pressure. Maybe there is low rewards or almost no rewards going on. Maybe you have a low feedback quality, performance pressure, social things like bullying, conflicts, feeling attacked. So all of that happens in code reviews. That's the brutal, honest truth. And so we have to weigh the benefits that we have with these pain points. The good news is that I've been working with a lot of teams over the years and these pain points can actually be worked on. So you can remove those pain points and you can really get to a very, very beneficial practice where all of your engineers said, I never want to work in a team without code reviews anymore, right? So you can reduce the pain points if you're deliberately working on them and you can increase the benefits. And so how do you have to do that? Well, you have to, first of all, not just accept that, well, there is a feature, we are using it, and now everything will work out of the box. Um, code reviews are actually a socio-technical engineering practice. This means that you have to have really good social skills and you have to have really good technical skills. And if we think back about, let's, let's think about testing as an engineering practice. Who would assume that an engineer starts testing automated test, writing automated test, uh, integration test, without ever having read anything or learned anything about testing. That's not something that we would assume. But the code reviews are actually even more complex because you have the socio and technical uh, engineering practice, right? So uh, testing, you just have to deal with yourself and the code. Now you have to deal with your peers and the code. And then there's actually an, another layer which makes the code reviews so painful and so difficult and that's the organizational skills that you have to do because it's not only you writing the code it's also somebody else you know reviewing the code they have to have time they have, they have to be willing to be uh, to look at that and as an organization we have to decide how are we doing code reviews what do we want to get out of code reviews right so we have the uh, social side we have the technical side and we have the organizational skills and it's actually for me really wild that people are not thinking about how can we learn that? How can we train our engineers? How can we learn as a group, as, as an organization, as a team? And so this is uh, why I think it's so important to think about code reviews and really how can we do them in a better way. So when I was working with teams and I saw this huge list of, of pain points that they are experiencing, I was thinking like, where's the root cause, right? So where, sh where should we start? Should we start working on, you know, the social interactions? Should we start working on um, the, the low feedback quality? And when I analyzed that over and over again, I saw actually that there are two patterns, two main pain points that um, teams experience. And if you work on those two, you can actually improve a lot of the others, right? So they are all falling into place. And this is slow turnaround time, and low code review feedback quality, right? So either it takes really a lot of time or uh, the quality is really, really low. And funnily, it's not either or, it's even that it can be combined, right? So some of the teams, and this is what I call the code review quadrant, and I would like to have people really reflect on that and think about where are we in, in as, an, as a team uh, in our code review practice, right? Do we have like high review speed, but low review? quality right so a lot of looks good to me uh, within a, a few hours or even minutes or do we have like maybe um, a high feedback quality right so thorough reviews but it takes really a lot of time or are we even in a blocking state where we have like slow reviews and low feedback quality right so I, i'm getting look looks good to me or or something like that or some nitpicking uh, but i have to wait wait an, a, a week for that and I think where every team wants to be is in this power review area, right? In this quadrant place here, where you have thorough reviews, you get really good review feedback back, um, but the reviews are also delivered in a, in a very timely manner. And so when I'm working with teams, I really try to get them into that place, right? So that we are improving the feedback quality and the review speed. Today, uh, because this whole conference is about um, productivity, I will mostly talk about speed and how can we speed up. And so, but for that, I want to do some mental exercise with you, right? So a little bit of brainstorming. If I say I want to increase the review speed, what do you think happens with feedback quality? Can we increase both? Because that's what I'm actually promising in my code review workshops. Can we increase the speed and the feedback value at the same time? Or is this, is, is this impossible? 
Maybe we think something like this happens. If we increase the speed, we actually decrease the feedback value. Well, I'm writing a code review book. Let's say I tell you, please review my first chapter. It has 30 pages and I give you five minutes. What will happen? What kind of feedback can you give me? Well, it's a very different kind of feedback than if I give you a whole day to review those 30 pages. And very similar, we see that in code reviews, that if you think about really this reviewer perspective, well, one person in front of their, of their code review, if you're increasing the speed, we are decreasing the review value, right? Obviously, there's a certain point where it's okay, but if you don't have enough time, you cannot give a, a, a very quality, thorough review. And there are studies around this. This is a study from Cisco Systems, for example, where we see that the defect detection rate, right? So how many defects per thousand lines of code are people finding versus how many lines of code they have to review within an hour. And you see that around 200, it starts to drop, right? And so from this study, there's actually this guideline that you should have like 200 to 400 lines per code max. And nowadays, these, uh, the suggestions are even lower, right? Less than 200 lines of code. It would be better having 100 lines of code. And so, um, so there's a correlation, uh, some relationship between the speed and the value. Um, I'm not going to go more deep into that, but you can actually increase both. And where the, where's the easiest to do that is with the process speed, because reviewing, as I said, is not only an individual practice, it's a team practice. And so suddenly it's not only how long does that person take when they are in front of the review, looking through your code, right? Let's say you send them 400 lines of code, it doesn't really matter if they take an hour or one and a half. That's, that's not the real cost that you have in code reviews. The real cost that you have is that that person needs to have time to look at the code review, and that could be four hours. And maybe there's another person even on the code review because you need two thumbs up. And so that person needs six hours until they can get to the code review. Maybe there is like a time, time zone difference or whatnot. And then it doesn't matter if one needs 45 minutes and the other an hour, right? So this is the smaller cost, the really expensive cost are the process costs around. And what I see over and over again, and there are many studies also around that, is that if you have like the process speed, if you increase that, you make that faster, more smooth, then you're increasing the speed back, uh, the review value. And I want to give you a small example for that. Let's just, uh, um, let's just imagine that I'm sending you the same feedback today versus a week later. Even though it's the same feedback today, it will be more important, more valuable to you than if I send it to you in a week, right? And so this is just to, to summarize the problem that we are seeing. And this is a person um, that states, the problem is that there can be a lot of lag between asking someone to review the PR and them actually doing it, or between addressing comments and then making another look, right? Worst of all, you never really know how long things will take. So it's hard to know whether you should switch gears for the rest of the day or not. Right, so this is, I think, a good, very personal and very individual perspective on the problem. You can have, obviously, also an organizational perspective, but this is an individual perspective, and a lot of people, I think, feel these pain points. And so one rule of uh, thumb, but really a good rule, is that if you're in the middle of a focused task, such as writing code, don't interrupt yourself to do a code review, right? So the worst that you can have is, like, some pull request reminders, code review reminders popping up while you're doing something very productive, while you're in a deep work phase, and then you're going to do a code review. That's actually a horrible practice, right? So we don't want that. And um, there are also a lot of studies. This is actually a study done by, by Microsoft around uh, interruptions during developer time, right? People writing code. And we see that it increases task completion time, so it takes longer. It makes you make worse decisions. It leads to more errors, frustration, annoyance, and anxiety. So no, 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 we don't want that. There are also other studies that show that even two seconds of interruptions cause a lot of more mistakes and, and, and a lot of delay. So what can we do instead of like hopping over to the code review? What can we do? Well, there are a couple of really best practices uh, that we can extract out. This was a study that um, I've been doing at Microsoft and we could really generalize a couple of those things where we say, 
independent of the practices of the teams, because uh, code reviews at, at Microsoft are very diverse, right? Teams have different practices that they have. Those are common strategies that really are helpful to speed up the code review and improve the value. Well, first of all, self-review. So instead of sending code out, you do the review yourself. Maybe you have even a checklist there. You see the diffs and probably you experienced that yourself, that you had you were writing a feature and you actually forgot that you did this and that and changed something over there as well. And only when you're creating a pull request, you suddenly see it again, right? That's also called the expert blind spot. You get very, um, very familiarized with your own code changes. So looking at that and really making sure this is high quality code, the highest quality code that I can produce before sending it to somebody else, right? So really small management cost here. Then having small reviews, and I will talk a little bit more about this, so important coherent code changes that you'd really make sense. And we'll talk about this as well. Context, write those code review descriptions. I know nobody does it, but there's plenty of, of research that also shows that it's really important. I've done one and, and we saw that the, the effect is really tremendous. Training, it's so important that people know what to look for in code reviews, how to do a code reviews, that you have set up right rules that people are not um, wasting time on deciding whether or not they should comment on that. And maybe they are arguing in code reviews about something, but really have a training and have some education around that, that people know uh, what to expect and how to do that. Then run the test first. You run the test first and then you send it for code reviews. Have automation in place. Whatever automation can do, people don't have to do. And that's two thumbs up. If I, you know, if I have more hands, I would have more hands up. Automation is really important. So it could be study analysis, linters, style checkers, and, and a lot of other things. So what you can automate, please automate it so that people don't have to do it. And then have the right tools around it, CI and CD, right? There could be risk assessment, and that goes a little bit back to training again, that people actually know what's the risk associated with this change. And depending on that, you actually assign the right reviewers. And then it's crystal clear uh, guidelines and policies that really reflect your goals, because only then you're actually doing something very productive here. But there are other things also, and a lot of uh, those things has to do who should be on the review, when should they do the review, right? How many reviewers and so on. And there are some strategies that you can actually have that are beneficial, like time blocks that you say, well, developers start actually the day or end the day with uh, some code reviews. So it could be in the middle, depending on the time zones that you have also uh, to serve, right? There could be rotations. A developer takes over a code review per day or per week. Right? There could be behavioral uh, mechanisms that you say, well, whenever you're sending out a code review, you're asking for a code review, you do one in return. And there are also algorithms that can help you, like round robin or load balancing algorithms and tools that help you to actually assign that automatically. But you have to be aware that your, your strategy here has to reflect your goals, right? Finding defects, improvements, awareness, mentoring, and teaching, tracing, and tracking, right? If I want to find defects, I definitely have to have a person that's more experienced. And the best is a person that has seen this code before. We have seen that in studies. If you want to have mentoring and teaching, maybe you want a junior engineer here. And now we're coming back to the risk. Well, then some automatic approaches where you have like a round robbing are not the best because a high a high change, a high risk change, for example, shouldn't be assigned to a junior engineer. So it's a little bit more complicated here, but what you can definitely do is you can work on smaller reviews. That's so important, right? Small and coherent changes. And how you do that? Well, with feature flagging, so you're working on smaller things and you just push that out um, in production even, right? Uh, while you're still developing it. Um, it also means that you're heavy branching and using Git to really make sure that you're reviewing smaller code things. So this is a study also from Cisco where we see the correlation between logs, uh, lines of code under review and time. And you see that there is a correlation, right? It goes down and it's not the same as before because here it doesn't matter how long time, how long the people have time. So you can give them two hours a day. Uh, we still see that they're not finding the defects if there are so many things. And we did a similar study at Microsoft and here you see not the lines of code, but the number of files in the change set. And you see it goes down, right? So the percentage of useful comments uh, decreases drastically with the number of files in the change set. So you want um, independent and self-contained code changes. And this is a little bit tricky, but let's have a toy example. Let's say you're working on a feature and while you're in the, in the, in the first file, right, you see some 
something and you, you know, enact the Boy Scout rule and you say, well, I'm renaming this here. It's a refactoring. And then you see a fix, right? You have to fix something because you revealed a bug while doing this feature. And so you actually go into other um, files and you're doing things here. Well, now you're sending this out because it's trivial to you, right? It's called the expert blind spot again, right? So it's really trivial to you, but it's actually hard for the others to understand. It would be much better if this, you know, would be extracted in one pull request or in one code review, and then a fix would be in one code review and the feature in one, because then you have coherent, um, um, a coherent file or change set, and it's more easy for the other person to understand. And understanding code comprehension is really tricky in code reviews. Right? So you want actually to do that. And you can use, for example, this is just one approach. There are many, many approaches, but this is one approach. You could have like review branches for that, right? So instead of committing everything on one work in progress pull request and then have this um, request, and people could also use like commit based reviews. Uh, but it's also nice if you have like each of those steps as a sep uh, separate branch, which is on top of the other branch, which also means you can send it out for review and can work further. And then you send it out for review and work further. And it's really better for code comprehension to do it that way. Well, this brings me somehow to the end. Um, I know it was very short. I was given 20 minutes, so I tried to put as much information as I could in there. And I really focused on the productivity part here. So really small coherent changes are the key. And there are a lot of techniques that you can actually do to do that. Um, it's a, it takes a little bit of training. It takes a little bit of um, and practicing, a little bit of mom, muscle memory, right? A little bit like the single responsibility principle also not comes to you. You have to actually learn it and apply it. Uh, but then I think it's very, very powerful. And you have to think about how to how do we organize that, that it's actually fitting our goals, right? How are we going to do code reviews as a collective, as a team, so that nobody actually suffers? You know, one has this pile of reviews and the other does nothing, um, or you're waiting too long. In general, code reviews, if you work on your Communication skills, so important. Knowing what to look for in code reviews, really, really important. Reducing review burden is also very important also to speed up code reviews. Clear guidelines and policies, very important to speed them up. And as I said, education and training. If you have brown bags around that really make code reviews a topic that is discussed and treated with respect and uh, deliberately um, improved in your organization, I think this is very, very important. So if you want, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And now I think it's time for questions and the discussion. There is also a free ebook if you want to download that. And uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much for listening to my talk.